Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for Understanding LEDs webinar. My name is Beth, and I'll be co-hosting today's webinar, which means I'll be monitoring chat and conducting polling at the end of the webinar. Today, we'll be covering highlights from our half-day seminar, LED Lighting, Changing All the Rules. We hope that after today, you'll be able to understand some of the fundamentals and apply them at your facility to help you save energy and money. We also want to thank our sponsors, the Energy Trust of Oregon and the Northwest Energy Efficiency Alliance. Based on customer feedback, we know that they appreciate that we're aligned with these two organizations to help eliminate any confusion regarding energy efficiency and renewables. Before I introduce the presenter for today, I'd like to show you some tools you'll be using during the webinar. To the right of your screen, you'll see several windows, the participants window, the chat window, and the polling window, which will appear at the end of the webinar. If you have any questions today during the webinar, you'll, you can submit them to me through chat, the host, and the instructor will answer them at the end of the webinar. Because this will be an informal session today, if you'd like to share an example or you have a question you'd like the instructor to address immediately, please feel free to, use the, to raise your hand using the raise hand icon that you'll see at the bottom of the participants window. And uh, at the top left-hand corner of the screen, underneath the quick start menu, you'll see some tools, which I'm gonna underline here in red. The instructor will um, ask you to use these on specific slides during the webinar, and he'll remind you of their location, so um, you shouldn't have any problem with that. Now I'd like to introduce the presenter for today, Mark Whitney, uh, PGE. Mark has worked as a lighting specialist at PGE for over 17 years, and he currently provides technical lighting support for our commercial and industrial customers. This support can include an on-site consultation and help getting involved with energy trust efficiency programs. Mark is active with the Portland, Oregon section of the Illuminating Engineering Society, and he is a certified, lighting certified and LED accredited professional. And now I'd like to hand the presentation over to Mark. One moment, Mark. Okay, go ahead. Great. Thanks, Beth, and welcome everyone to today's lighting webinar. And also thanks for taking time out of your busy schedules to learn about LEDs and uh, uh, having uh, coffee or whatever as early in the morning, at least for those on the, on the West Coast. And uh, we'll learn about how LEDs can uh, help you make lighting upgrade decisions. This webinar is designed with PGE end use customers in mind, particularly those that qualify for Energy Trust of Oregon cash incentives. However, this webinar will be beneficial for all listeners today. LEDs, or light emitting diodes, as the acronym stands for, are creating a revolution in lighting because they offer many advantages that other light sources can't provide nearly as well. However, they're not always the best or even the most efficient option now for many applications. So this webinar will help you decide which LEDs are ready for you now and in the near future. You can see today's agenda. And throughout the presentation, I'll be focusing on saving energy, saving money, and providing better quality lighting through a lighting upgrade project. The goal today is to supply you with information about LED lighting and energy efficiency that will make a difference at your place of business. So we invite your active participation today and plan to leave 10 minutes at the end to answer questions. There we go. So these are the key learning objectives today. Uh, this would be a good time to uh, practice your annotation tools located in the upper left-hand corner. Uh, so if you feel like it, you can uh, uh, indicate which one of these uh, learning objectives might be of most uh, interest to you. Uh, this webinar will not go in depth on how LEDs work, but I will go over some basics. And throughout the presentation, I'll talk about familiar lighting technologies and what the LED alternatives are. Focus will be on retrofit, but new construction applies also. Keep in mind that some LED applications make sense right now, while some need to, be, need to become more mature or become less expensive. And then near the end, I'll show you uh, how you can get help with lighting upgrade projects. You're probably hearing a lot about LEDs and there's a wide range of uh, quality and performance, so you need to be informed in order to make good choices. These pictures represent some recent award winners, such as uh, the Next Generation Luminaires, 
and also which focuses on commercial uh, and industrial type fixtures and lighting for tomorrow is more residential. So these are some winners from 2011 and if you want to check out the most recent winners uh, from this year you can uh, check out the website. Here's a graph that shows U.S. lighting electric electricity consumption by sector and lamp type. And you can see that residential lighting is dominated by incandescent lamps and the commercial sector by fluorescent T8s. Uh, the industrial and the outdoor sector uses a lot of HID, which means high pressure sodium and metal halide. And if you look really closely at the total down here at the right uh, lower cor right corner, LED barely shows up, probably less than 1% currently. This graph illustrates the dramatic growth that is expected from LEDs in the not too distant future. That uh, large bar to the right is 2015. That's just a couple years away. Now most of this is going to come from existing, uh, come from uh, replacing existing uh, incumbent technologies. So what is an LED? So LEDs are a type of solid state lighting. Uh, so I don't plan to go into a lot of detail about the technical side of LEDs because of time and also because uh, quite frankly I'm, I'm not a uh, rocket scientist and this is not my strength. But uh, an LED is a semiconductor. It's a device that generates light and the movement of electrons through a semiconductor material uh, illuminates a tiny, tiny light source as we call LEDs at the uh, uh, positive negative junction. LED lighting products use light, uh, light emitting diodes to produce light very efficiently. As you can see from this picture on the right, there's a lot of things that are needed to make an LED work. You need to have things uh, that, that connect uh, the LED electronically. You need a, a, a package of some kind to hold things together. Uh, a heat sink is very important and usually some type of a lens to uh, direct the light in the direction that you want it to go. So in many ways an LED is the opposite of a photovoltaic solar cell. Instead of turning light into electricity, LEDs turn electricity into light. So LED lighting has a lot in common with the fast-paced high-tech industry and this clashes with the relatively so slow-paced lighting industry. A lot of culture adjustments uh, need to be made with this technology. So how do LEDs make white light? Well, there's two main ways, and the most common and the least expensive is the one on the left. And this is where you take a blue or a violet LED and you coat it with phosphors that are similar to the ones that uh, they use for fluorescent lighting. The other method combines red, green, and blue LEDs. And by varying the intensity of each LED, you can not only create various shades of white, but also any other color. And this method is used primarily in theatrical lighting. So why use LEDs? Probably the number one reason that uh, people give is because they produce light in a very efficient way. Uh, this chart, uh, which looks like a bunch of spaghetti, uh, shows some of the older technologies uh, like HID, fluorescent, uh, incandescent, and shows their improvements over time. And here we show that uh, LEDs and OLEDs uh, just started right after the turn of the century, and their improvements have just shot up like, like a rocket. One reason is they have a very long lamp life, 35,000, 50,000, even 100,000 hours or more is not uncommon. One of the strengths that they have is that uh, they have very, um, uh, besides the long lamp life, is that they're very directional. So this works well for some applications, but for others it makes the uh, lighting more challenging. Uh, they're also very small, which means they can fit in small spaces. However, that's not always the case because the ones with a higher light output need a large heat sink, so sometimes the fixtures need to be big. Uh, dimmability is also a strong feature of LEDs. However, compatibility with existing dimmers is an issue. We have three no's coming up. They have no mercury, they have no UV, 
and no infrared heat. However, LEDs still conduct heat, so it's not like there's no heat at all. This chart illustrates the historical and predictive trend of LED light output, uh, how it increases along with concurrent cost uh, decreases. So this is known as Haight's Law, and it's the cost as the cost per lumen falls by a factor of 10 every decade, and the amount of light generated per LED package increases by a factor of 20 over that same amount of time. So this is similar to Moore's Law for computer chips, where it predicts the performance of uh, of the performance for computer chips. And while this law has held true in the past, the advances are beginning to slow down somewhat. Some of the challenges for LEDs, uh, number one, I think, is thermal management. They do produce heat, and they have to get that heat away from that, uh, that, that junction. And it's conductive heat rather than radiant heat like incandescence, which we mentioned before. Uh, lamp life is different for LEDs. We measure the lamp life on useful life, usually when they uh, degrade to 70% uh, of the original output versus failure for most light sources, which is measured when uh, a sample of, of uh, light sources, 50% uh, of them fail over a certain period of time. We need more lumens per watt. It's getting there where it's very useful, but it has the potential to be as much as 200 lumens per watt. Uh, another important thing is they need to be less expensive. Uh, color and performance needs to be more consistent, especially for your demanding applications. Flicker and dimming uh, is an issue, especially when LEDs are used with existing dimmers. And how to specify LEDs? It's, it's new, it's different, and education and training is needed. Fortunately, the government is here to help. Um, and this is true. The Department of Energy is taking the lead in developing and promoting energy efficient solid state lighting. Uh, the website here has lots of info. So if you haven't already, I, I would write this down and make this one of your uh, first stops in looking up LED information. So research and development activities are identifying ways to make LEDs more efficient and less expensive. Uh, they also promote making as many components as possible right here in the good old United States. Uh, demonstration projects are very helpful by finding out how LEDs perform in the real world. So any new technology needs to be tested in order to gain uh, confidence uh, in their performance claims. Standards for testing are critical for consumer confidence. Uh, the, the government also sponsors product competitions, and they've challenged manufacturers to create better market-ready products. End users need help and confidence when choosing to buy LED products, so good and useful labeling along with educational resources are available at this website. So the LED Lighting Facts label, this allows retailers, utilities, and end users to compare products uh, to the manufacturer claims and also to similar products. So it provides a, a quick summary of product performance in uh, five areas. So a good way to think of this is kind of like nut a nutrition label for lighting. And this is a voluntary label and the information is supplied by the manufacturer. So on this label we're going to find uh, the light output in lumens, uh, the watts, uh, lumens per watt, this is like miles per gallon. Uh, the uh, correlated color temperature, which measures um, how warm or cool this light source is going to be. And also the color rendering index. This is a 0 to 100 scale, with 100 being the best. Uh, so in this case, the score of 87 would be actually quite good. The caliper is like the consumer reports of solid state lighting. So LED products are obtained anonymously and then they're thoroughly tested. And then you get periodic reports and they're posted online uh, for everyone to, to take a look at. Uh, and if you sign up, you can get these uh, reports uh, when they come out, will show up in your email. There's one that just showed up yesterday for uh, suspended uh, uh, pendants LEDs. And there's a summer report that uh, is just been posted for that. So once again, 
this website is where you want to go for this information. Standards and technical help are crucial for the development of solid state lighting. And here's just a few. Uh, one that's uh, familiar to uh, perhaps a lot of you is LM79. And this provides a standard testing method for LED products. Now keep in mind, just because a product claims that they have an LEM79 report doesn't mean it's great. It just means that it's been evaluated properly. Uh, LM80 is a method for measuring the lumen depreciation of LEDs, and TM21 provides a method that allows you to take the LM80 data and then make some sort of projection about the lumen maintenance of LED light sources. So in, in summary, these standards are very helpful, and they should be used as a starting point for evaluating LED products. So Energy Trust cash incentives are available, but they're only available for uh, LED products that are on an approved list. Uh, both the uh, national LED lists um, are quite long, and they include products that meet Energy Star and Design Lights consortium standards, including lifetime testing. Uh, the Lighting Design Lab, uh, on the other hand, they include LED products that have not yet made either of the national list. However, the Lighting Design Lab has found that these LED lamps and fixtures are expected to qualify for either Energy Star or Design Lights Consortium in the near future. So in, in this way, uh, the Lighting Design Lab is a temporary list for LED products, and they can only remain on that list for a maximum of, of one year. So to get to any of these lists, go to the Lighting uh, Design Lab uh, website, and it'll take you to any of these lists. Keep in mind that uh, the Energy Trust of Oregon recognizes any LED lamp or fixture that is on any of those three lists. Uh, now, real quickly, we'll just go over some lighting terms that will help us describe lamps. Uh, number one is that lamps have a letter that designates the relative shape of the lamp. And there's also a number that designates the maximum diameter in uh, eighths of an inch. So an example here at the bottom, uh, the familiar T8, the T stands for tubular, and the 8 stands for 8 eighths of an inch. Uh, over here you have a globe, which is 30 eighths, a reflector lamp, which is an R, uh, an MR16, a multi-mirrored reflector. This one's a candle. Uh, the common light bulb is very often known as an A19. And this one, a directional lamp, is a parabolic aluminized reflector that is 38 eighths of an inch, or about uh, four and three quarters inch in maximum diameter. Now what's interesting is that LEDs are still known as a PAR 38, but it no longer has a parabolic aluminized reflector of any kind. But uh, for the near term, it's still going to be called a PAR 38 just because of the familiarity with the, uh, with the lamps that it's replacing. One of the main replacement targets for using LED is the ordinary light bulb. And there's new lighting laws that are going to virtually eliminate the most common ones, and that's starting with the 100-watt bulb this year. Generally speaking, we have three replacement options. One way is to look at this as uh, good, better, or best. Uh, good is an energy-saving incandescent, better known as a halogen. Uh, better would be uh, compact fluorescence, saving about 75%. And the, and the best, saving 75% or more, in most cases, is the LED. So this is a chart that compares uh, these three different uh, choices that you have. One thing you notice with lamp life is the halogens still don't have a very good lamp life. Uh, CFLs are much better. Uh, LEDs have the longest lamp life. But when you go over to first cost, LEDs are going to cost a lot more. And when you get over to dimming, uh, the halogens uh, dim very well. LEDs, some do, some don't. CFLs really don't. They can dim, but not, that's not their strong point. Uh, color quality, uh, considered to be excellent for the uh, halogens, 
and the LEDs, most LEDs, where the CFLs, most people would say the color quality is not top notch. Here's some examples from GE Phillips in Sylvania. The energy saving incandescence still makes sense for applications with low hours of operation, where you want dimming, and where you want the warm color temperature shift when you dim them. The compact fluorescents are going to be for applications with longer hours of operation and don't have a need for dimming. The LEDs are going to be best for applications with the longest hours of operation and where replacement is expensive or difficult and also where you want dimming and also applications where you don't uh, uh, where you're going to have frequent switching. LEDs don't care how much you switch them. Now remember that one of the strengths of LEDs is that they're very directional. So this makes it a challenge to imitate the omnidirectional light output of an incandescent light bulb. This means you need to pay attention when buying an LED replacement. So the, the LEDs you see here on the left and the right are do pretty good at replicating the uh, light output of a regular light bulb. However, this one in the middle, and there's several companies that make them like this, has more light in one direction. So if you wanted to use this one for a table lamp, you can see that you're not going to get the downlight that you want with a table lamp. However, and now we're going to turn these upside down. However, this could work out great if you installed it base up and you wanted much more light to shine down, perhaps maybe in a task light. So keep this in mind when you're selecting LED light bulbs. Now when you get to down lights, uh, we need to know about, um, this is where efficacy really comes into play. And efficacy again is this, this is like your miles per gallon, this is your lumens per watt. So here we have a, a CFL with an efficacy of 60 lumens per watt. However, you put it in a fixture that only has 58% efficiency and the lumens per watt that's delivered to the room is only 35. So that's quite a bit less. Now LED fixtures like this, uh, this down light fixture or, or a kit, uh, they're tested in a manner that tests the whole thing, not just, not just the lamp. So when it says it's 70 lumens per watt, it's assuming 100% fixture efficiency and all the lumens that are rated for that fixture are gonna be delivered uh, lumens. So the delivered efficacy here is 70 lumens per watt. So from this example, you can see that if you chose this 13 watt LED, you would get the same amount of light as the 26 watt CFL and save 50%. So by any measure, the LED makes an excellent choice for uh, down lights. So let's turn our attention now to track lights. And we're gonna find out the many reasons why this is one of the very best LED applications right now. Now once again, keep in mind when I use the term halogen, it refers to a more efficient type of incandescent lamp. I, I put this slide up here just to remind people that even though that there's uh, new lighting laws for uh, light bulbs, there's also laws that affect re reflector lamps. And the bottom line here is that if you wanna get most of your PARs or reflector lamps, you're going to get you're going to need to get the more efficient but more expensive IR version of those halogens. But better yet, and I'm going to show you why it's better to upgrade to LED. So until just recently, there really wasn't an acceptable alternative for halogen reflector lamps for track lighting. Uh, the CFLs have a poor beam pattern; and they just don't have good enough color quality. Uh, ceramic metal halide lamps have been a, a reasonable choice, but they have shortcomings in light quality, lamp life, and uh, they're pretty expensive. So the screw-in replacement directional lamps have improved to the point where they're, they're now an excellent alternative to halogen. Energy savings, uh, they have excellent color quality, long lamp life. This is what makes them a compelling choice. But even if they didn't save any energy, it would still be cheaper to buy one LED replacement at say $50 instead of 10 halogens 
at $10 each over time. And what about the hassle of changing those 10 lamps? However, they do save a lot of energy and even qualify for generous cash incentives through the Energy Trust of Oregon, which often covers half the lamp cost. And the paybacks are usually one to one and a half years. So the Energy Trust may consider a custom incentive for replacement uh, trackhead fixtures. But again, you must use an approved product and meet other program criteria. A couple of terms that are important when uh, choosing uh, LED directional lamps or any directional lamp. Uh, one is the beam angle, and the other is the center beam candle power. So it's best to get a few samples and uh, try them out. The directional lamps uh, generally have beam angles from 10 to 60 degrees. 25 and 40 degrees are two common LED choices. So the beam angle that you choose depends in part on the mounting height and the distance to the objects you want illuminated. The center beam candle power will also help uh, determine how brightly those objects will be illuminated. So this may be listed on the box or you may have to go to the uh, product website. So when you test out your sample, look for smooth tapered edges and make sure there's no dark spots, streaking, or noticeable uh, color variations. The larger PAR38 and PAR30 lamps have an easy, uh, easy time dissipating heat because of their large size. However, this becomes um, more difficult to manage the heat when you get smaller lamps like your MR16s, PAR16s, and uh, these candle or candelabra style bulbs. Uh, currently, you can easily find MR16s to replace up to 35 watt halogen MR16s, but you're gonna find it's more challenging to find ones that replace the uh, 50 watt halogens. So I'm gonna ask your help here in just a second. So uh, be prepared to use one of the annotation tools in the upper left-hand corner. So some companies uh, cheat a little bit by making their MR16 slightly bigger than the standard MR16s. So can you pick out the guilty offenders from this lineup? It's the two tall guys on the left. So it might be okay if the lamp sticks out a little bit from some fixtures but they may not fit in others. So again, you need to try them out before you buy a large quantity. Most of the larger PAR lamps come with the standard Edison screw bases. And many of the uh, candle style bulbs come with a smaller base and you can get an adapter socket if you need to, to put them in a regular socket. And these operate at 120 volts. MR16s, uh, are typically low voltage, and they usually come with uh, pin bases that are uh, 5.3 millimeters apart. PAR 16s and uh, PAR 20s will often have a, a push and turn base uh, called the GU10, and they operate at 120 volts AC. So this illustrates, again, you need to know what kind of lamp you're replacing so that you can get the correct LED replacement. Now we're gonna switch gears and talk about uh, linear fluorescent versus LED. Which one is better? So you need to know that linear fluorescent works really well right now. Uh, so LED is gonna to need to be probably about 40% better in order to be a mainstream competitor. And replacing LED, um, sorry, replacing linear fluorescent with LED is only cost effective for a few applications right now. Uh, especially if they have long hours of operation and ones in cold environments. But this is changing fast. Um, and here's some of the key issues that will help you decide uh, when to switch over. One is cost. Again, that's a big issue. The LED prices are coming down. Uh, lamp life, you can get uh, 50,000 hour fluorescent uh, tubes, which is rated at uh, lamp failure. Uh, LED 75,000 plus with a useful life of at about um, 
30% degradation in uh, lumen output. Lumens per watt, uh, you can get the fluorescent tubes at 100 lumens per watt as well as LEDs at 100 lumens per watt, but you're going to have to put that fluorescent tube in some type of fixture, which is going to reduce the lumens per watt to 80 or 85. Uh, LED, uh, linear fluorescence, a proven workhorse, where LED looks very promising. Confidence is getting higher, but it's still an unproven uh, technology in some ways. With controls, uh, frequent switching is an issue for fluorescence, and LEDs don't mind the frequent switching. Uh, fluorescent gets less efficient when dimmed, where LED gets more efficient when dimmed. So now we're going to look at a, some common linear fluorescent applications where the recessed troffer is the most common. And this represents a big target for LED. And this prismatic lens version is probably the most widely used and also the least expensive. Notice that uh, the high vertical illumination on the walls. And keep in mind that this light di distribution can be challenging for LEDs to attain because of the directional nature of LEDs. The parabolic troffer was originally designed to help eliminate glare on computer screens, but it's considered to be a more modern type. Um, but a much bigger issue is the exposed bare lamps and overhead glare that bothers people with this type of fixture. Also notice the um, upper walls are dark, creating a, a cave effect because of the sharp cutoff. So retrofitting these parabolics with LED T8 lamps is a tempting option, but this can make that cave effect even worse. It can cause even more glare, and it also gives the fixture an unnatural looking appearance if you've ever looked at one. But a lot of people are gonna to wanna to retrofit with LED T8s. Uh, the LED T8 salesmen are calling on companies, and so many that People think, well, this must be a great retrofit option. And I say, well, maybe not so fast. One reason is the light output. This shows the testing results that Caliper had uh, on LED T8s. And uh, there's actually been a more recent test. But you can see here that the light output uh, for most LED T8s is uh, sometimes half of what a, um, a good fluorescent uh, T8 is. Uh, the light distribution is also an issue. With the with T8, light goes off in all directions, and the fixtures were designed around that type of light output. Uh, LED T8s are going to have uh, light distribution just in the lower half. It's going to be somewhat wide. Some of them can be very narrow. And this illustrates, this red line shows the LED T8 and shows the distribution is different and it's half that of the, of the uh, fluorescent T8. Cost is an issue. A fluorescent T8 can cost $5 or less, where the LED T8s can cost $50 or more. Safety is a concern. Even though you can get UL approval for the lamps, there's still the question of the installing that lamp in, in a fixture. And you may or may not bypass the existing fluorescent ballast. So this is going to affect future lamp replacements. So what if you accidentally put a T8 back in this fixture someday? The color temperature quality and consistency is an issue. And this is important in this type of application because the lamps are so close together and you're going to be able to tell the difference in the uh, color quality and the color temperature. One thing that they found when they tested LED T8s is a lot of them failed during the testing procedure, whereas the fluorescent T8s are much more reliable. A much better approach than LED T8s is using LED light bars. These attach directly to the metal fixture housing, and that provides a natural heat sink. So the existing uh, fluorescent lamps uh, are removed along with the ballast. Uh, you keep the driver or not. Um, actually, with the light bars, you're going to re uh, take out the ballast and replace it with an LED driver. And 
maybe keep the prismatic lens. As you can see here on the right, maybe you don't want this kind of fixture appearance. And you can install these light bars and parabolics as well. So a much better approach when using light bars is to use a kit. Uh, this uh, usually comes with a more efficient lens. This one from Lithonia um, has a lens that matches their popular fluorescent fixtures uh, like the RT5. So from below, if you had a fluorescent one or an LED version, it would be hard to tell them apart. And there's a lot of companies that make this kind of kit, and there's a lot of lens options for this. These kits cost from oh, around $100 to $150, and they're very easy to install. Lumens per watt can be 90 lumens uh, per watt or higher. New LED fixtures can also use this type of light bar. Uh, here's uh, a couple examples of new LED troppers with different illumination approaches. Uh, Fine light and others are using uh, mid-power LED light engines that are similar, they're similar to the ones that they use to backlight uh, flat screen HD TVs. Cree is using a, um, uh, they, they've chosen to mount uh, an indirect reflecting LEDs on top of a, a room side heat sink strip, easy for me to say. These are commonly available in uh, 1x4s, 2x4s, uh, and 2x2s. Uh, and it seems that the 2x2 two two is the most popular as they offer the most uniform light distribution in all directions. Most of these new 2x2 uh, two two, uh, LED troffers are less than $200 uh, compared to new fluorescent fixtures that are around $100 to $150. Now this is a type of fixture that is often used in lobbies, uh, conference rooms, high-end office spaces, and it's typically chosen because of its good looks, its appearance, and also it tends to minimize glare. But it's expensive and facilities people will tell you it's very difficult to maintain. So you can get uh, LED fixtures with a similar look and also ones that have a much improved uh, performance. So if you're looking for this fluorescent version, I would seriously consider uh, getting the LED version instead if you're going to spend that kind of money. This is uh, color temperature uh, changing LEDs. This is an exciting option that works well with LEDs. For very little extra cost, you can get LED fixtures that can change their color temperature uh, either manually uh, by using this uh, a controller uh, that lets you choose the uh, light output as well as the color temperature, or you can automatically have the color temperature change throughout the day through a central control system. And you can look at uh, some award-winning uh, troffers and desk lamps at this uh, Plan LED uh, website. So color temperature changing fixtures can also have very positive benefits for your mood, your health, and also provide visual acuity benefits. And if you're more interested in this topic, here's a, a good website uh, that was just formed, um, and you can find out more about this type of lighting. Indirect and indirect direct fluorescent fixtures are popular because of their low glare and their even illumination. But these fixtures themselves, while they're somewhat uh, expensive, they're often cheaper to install than uh, research, research, uh, recessed troffers. However, you're going to find that there's not that many comparable LED versions yet. Although, as I mentioned earlier, Caliper just report, um, did a report that was released yesterday on suspended LED pendants. But most of those, I found, only have a, a direct component. There's only a couple that go both up and down. So one product that has the potential uh, is this edge lit illumination uh, fixture from GE. And this fixture is uh, translucent when it's turned off, and that helps minimize the visual impact of the fixture, say, when there's enough uh, daylight in the room to have the fixture turned off. So the fluorescent wrap fixture, um, they normally have a prismatic lens. Uh, that wraps around the sides and bottom of the fixture, uh, has a wide distribution, 
and it's a general use fixture that can be surface mounted but also uh, pendant mounted. Uh, this is used everywhere it should and also a lot of places where it shouldn't. So it's a common general use fixture that's also uh, inexpensive. So here's an example of an LED version. So I don't know the, the cost of this fixture, but I'm sure it's a lot more than your basic uh, fluorescent wrap fixture. So it's gonna need to be uh, a lot less expensive in order to compete with this uh, uh, linear fluorescent wrap fixture. HID stands for high intensity discharge, and that refers to mercury vapor, metal halide, or high pressure sodium. So the, the, the high bay fixture has a relatively narrow beam of light, and it's meant to be mounted at 20 feet or higher. And then you have a low bay fixture that has a much wider beam of light and is, uh, is best when it's used in lower ceiling applications. Both of these fixtures are currently being replaced very successfully with fluorescent fixtures. They often save 50%, uh, and these fluorescent fixtures also commonly have an occupancy sensor attached to each fixture for some additional savings. So this means that LED is gonna to have to be quite a bit better in order to compete against uh, fluorescent uh, uh, high bays and low bays. As you can see from these pictures, the LED high bays come in many shapes and sizes. So the performance is, is good, but these fixtures are at least twice as expensive, sometimes three and four times as expensive as fluorescent uh, high bay fixtures. The applications that are currently uh, cost effective are cold environments, especially uh, frozen storage warehouses. This fixture from uh, Digital Lumens has been especially successful uh, for this application because they're replacing uh, usually high pressure sodium that has to be on 24 seven because it takes so long for the fixtures to come to full brightness uh, when they're turned on. Uh, these uh, environments are often 20 degrees uh, below zero. So this LED fixture works great because LEDs like it cold and they don't mind frequent switching. Uh, so these fixtures come with a fixture mounted occupancy sensor and the LEDs come to full brightness instantly. So then after sensing inactivity, these fixtures switch off again after only say 30 seconds. So people that work in a, in a freezer don't wanna be there very long. So in this way, even though you might be spending $700 for this fixture, it's hardly ever gonna be on and you're gonna be saving 90% uh, over a high pressure sodium. And this, even though you're spending $700, this project has qualified for Energy Trust custom incentives. So because of limited time, um, I'm not gonna go over outdoor LED fixtures in detail. That would be a whole nother uh, seminar. So some of these are cost effective now, but most we find are not. Again, the high cost of the fixtures is probably the main, uh, is the main obstacle. But applications you might wanna consider are uh, gas station uh, canopies, uh, parking garages, uh, wall packs, these are starting to come down in price, and uh, parking lot lighting. And here's an example of one of the non-energy benefits for LED uh, outdoor lighting. Instead of getting this, um, most people would say not so pleasant uh, orange glow, you're gonna get uh, a much more natural uh, white light appearance and much more even as well. Uh, PGE uh, is beginning the process of changing out our street lights to LEDs. Uh, we had a tariff that was just approved Tuesday, so you can expect us to start uh, uh, installing these probably um, starting early next year. So in the future, I believe that the majority of lighting applications will use an LED light source. But for now, there's still a lot of good uh, choices like fluorescent and even ceramic metal halide for outdoor lighting, for example. So here's a list of uh, issues that you wanna consider. Uh, we talked uh, a lot about ambient temperature. Again, LEDs like it cold, uh, fluorescent does not. Uh, lamp life. 
Again, most sources are going to be judged on lamp failure, where LEDs are going to be judged on uh, lumen depreciation. Hours of operation is going to be very important for picking uh, LEDs for your application. If you have low hours of operation, it's not going to make any sense. Uh, lamp uh, efficacy versus fixture efficiency. You need to remember that uh, uh, other than LED, you're measuring the lumens per watt of the lamp, and then you put it in a fixture. Or with LEDs, you're measuring the light output of the fixture itself in, in most cases. Uh, drivers tend to be the weak link in uh, LEDs right now. Uh, so that's a very important consideration is the lifetime of, of the driver as well as other electrical components, not just the LED itself. Light distribution is going to be different with LEDs. So even though you have a, a fluorescent 2x2 two two and an LED 2x2, two two, the light distribution is going to be uh, maybe slightly different, maybe a lot different. Fluorescent is uh, tougher to control, where LEDs uh, can be much easier to control. Installing new fixtures is probably going to be the same for fluorescent LED, but uh, that is an issue. Maintenance costs, this is where LEDs can have a good uh, advantage. Uh, appearance of the fixture can be important. And if save the best for last, you always want to test drive a fixture, a retrofit kit you're considering. This is the best way to evaluate how it's going to perform. To save money with LEDs, there's incentives. Again, make sure it's on an approved list. So we have incentives uh, for LED downlights, uh, $30 for a kit or a new downlight fixture. One thing we didn't talk about is LEDs can be used for case lights. You've probably seen these in some of your local grocery stores. Uh, there's an energy trust incentive for this application. I think LED directional lamps are the best LED option available right now. And you can get uh, anywhere from uh, $15 to $25 for this type of application. And if it's not on the list, uh, there could be a custom incentive available. However, you must use an approved product and meet all the other uh, criteria for the Energy Trust program. So PG and Energy Trust can help you with energy efficiency projects at your place of business. You can either go to the PG website or give us a call, and we'll uh, talk to you about uh, having an energy efficiency consultation. If you're a commercial customer, you can call Paula Conway. If you're an industrial customer, contact John Maloney. All right, I'm going to take a deep breath. That was a lot of material in a short amount of time. Thanks for sticking with us. Now I want to turn over the remainder of the presentation to Beth for some additional information and to take your questions. Beth? Thank you, Mark. And I'd like to thank all of you for joining us today. We want to remind you of some upcoming webinars we have. So the slide you'll see in front of you um, lists, uh, excuse me, for seminars. Um, the next lighting seminar we have is December 5th, Better Lighting, Lower Costs Workshop in Hillsboro. And then the next webinar is Energy Monitoring for Energy Savings, November the 27th. And if you um, would like to register for these or any other seminars, webinars we have, please go to energyeducationcenter.com. And we'll be sending you um, a recording of the, of the presentation and the slides um, after this, and there'll be a link to that website as well. Before we proceed to the question and answer period of the webinar, I'd like to remind everyone that you can continue to submit questions to me uh, through chat, and I will ask them of Mark. And I'd like to draw everyone's attention to a feedback survey, which I just opened on your, um, on your screen. You should see it. We really appreciate your feedback and hope that you can take the time during the question and answer period to answer some of those questions. And now I'd like to proceed to the question and answer portion of the webinar. Mark, the uh, first question we have is, how much cheaper do you foresee LEDs getting in the future? Well, I, d I don't have a, uh, a crystal ball. But uh, LED prices uh, have steadily gone down at a fairly rapid pace. I, I see that slowing down somewhat. Uh, but because it's such a big market, 
uh, there's a lot of pressure on, on uh, getting prices down. So uh, I think that you're going to see uh, within, especially within one to two years, that uh, uh, LEDs for most applications are going to be down to a point where they're going to be competing with uh, especially your uh, recessed troffer fixtures. I think you're going to see that, uh, especially for new construction, I think it makes a lot of sense uh, to be specifying those uh, right now. Uh, one reason for new construction is that uh, when you specify uh, a light fixture, light fixtures are one of the last things to go in a building. Uh, so often a building is, the lights are going to go in maybe two or three years after they were specified. So if you uh, specify LED fixtures now, you can be pretty confident by the time the building is built that uh, that that's going to be the, the best choice uh, when the building, uh, when it's time to buy those fixtures. Uh, others are uh, already at a level, uh, especially directional lamps, that, that makes a lot of sense to, to use them right now. Great. Thanks, Mark. And actually, our next question is about directional LEDs. Um, I would like to try out a directional LED lamp. What is the best way to get a sample lamp to try, and which ones would you recommend? Well, you can uh, you can go to um, you know one of your local uh, uh, big box uh, home improvement stores or Costco. Those those have them. However, a lot of those are not approved lamps. They're not Energy Star. Uh, a lot of those are meant to be a, a residential lamp. So for commercial applications. You probably want to go to uh, uh, probably one of the uh, local local distributors. There's a place you can get one. Also, um, through PGE, we're happy. We have a, a, a large uh, sample case full of these LEDs, and we're happy to uh, bring them out to your place of business and um, uh, put them in one of your track head fixtures and try them out. Uh, this has been very successful. Just about everybody that has actually tried one out has said, this is great, I want more, I want them now, let's, let's, let's get some of these. So we can uh, come out to your place of business, have you try one out, uh, help you with the um, application forms, and get you set up with, with incentives. So this is, uh, I think, for, for PG uh, customers, the best way to try out an LED lamp. Great, thank you, Mark. And uh, next question is um, about indirect lighting. Uh, the uh, caller says, I like indirect lighting. Why don't we see more LED indirect lighting fixtures? LED indirect lighting fixtures, excuse me. That, that's a really good question. One I've asked because we've uh, gone to uh, fluorescent indirect lighting is probably your best choice for uh, office lighting, especially if you have uh, cubicle walls. Uh, it, uh, the fluorescent uh, indirects uh, bounce light off the ceiling in a nice, even way. Um, it's very pleasing. You then can supplement uh, relatively lower uh, light levels with task lights. So it's a great, uh, it's, it's a gr it's a great way to uh, light a space with fluorescent. With with LEDs, it's it's hard to get that smooth, even uh, look off the ceiling. Uh, again, because of the directional uh, nature of, of LEDs, they uh, it tends to be uh, somewhat spotty, um, and it's hard to get that uh, nice, even uh, uh, light distribution bouncing off the bouncing off the ceiling. And it's also been kind of expensive to make this this kind of fixture. Uh, so there there are a few available, and that report that I mentioned from from Caliper that just came out, I've only seen the summer report, uh, and so I I don't know. A lot about some of the findings, but uh, so so I suggest that you go to that caliper report at that uh, ssl.energy.gov website and read that summary report and get some more information about um, uh, LED indirect lighting. That's good advice, Mark. And um, next question, I'm sure some of us are all wondering is, what about LEDs for residential applications? What works well for our homes? Uh, there's a number of uh, LEDs that work well for your homes. Uh, one of the barriers for using LEDs uh, is the high cost, and the other is that residential has much lower hours of operation. 
so the, the paybacks are, are longer or they're just too long to uh, consider using LEDs from strictly a financial standpoint. Uh, however, they really make a lot of sense as far as uh, how long they last. With those long hours of operation, you're going to get something that could last uh, 20 years or more. Uh, so if you pick one, you want to uh, pick one that you, that you like. Uh, again, LEDs for residential especially is a, is a lot like picking an appliance. You know, you're going to be having that uh, uh, LED lamp or fixture for at least 20 years, so you better you know, make sure that, that you like it. But one of the applications that, that I really like and I've actually uh, installed in my own home is for your uh, uh, can lights, for your down lights, uh, especially in the kitchen where you might have four hours, uh, five, six hours a day uh, operation. So that starts to make sense. Uh, so you can get these kits. Uh, they cost uh, about $35, which uh, may sound like a lot, but uh, you would actually spend a lot more on replacement halogens than you would uh, for this one LED uh, retrofit. One of the things that I liked about it is that uh, I have a low ceiling and the distribution from this fixture is, is very wide. So it, uh, it, uh, it eliminates the uh, pools of light that I got with the, with the halogens that I was using. So th this is one that I would highly recommend. Uh, and it also works really well with the dimmers that I have. But again, don't go out and buy a dozen of these get one, take it home, try it out in your dimmer, and see if you want more of those. Great, and um, actually the next question is about dimmers. I heard that LEDs don't work well with existing dimmers. Why is that? But Mark, you just said that it does with yours, so is that? It, it, some, some, some do and some don't. Uh, some uh, LED fixtures, you can go to the website and they, they'll give you a list of compatible dimmers. So that's one resource. Um, but LEDs um, are, they, they can work with the dimmers that uh, um, are made to work with incandescent. Uh, incandescent uh, dimmers typically, the, the sine wave is chopped either at the forward or, or the, uh, at, at the end. And uh, so that the on and off cycles are um, less frequent so there's less light output. Uh, it, it's best uh, to have a dimmer that is made for LED. So, again, you know, try it out. Some work, some don't. Uh, but if you um, are building a, a new home or a new a new building, uh, putting new dimmers that are made for LEDs is your is your best solution. Great. And our final question. Um, is, and it's a good one I think for the ending, is now a good time to get LEDs or should we wait for more testing and others to try first? I think I hear you saying yes and no. Yes and no, very good. <laughs> uh, yes for some and no for others. Uh, I would uh, go over the you know list of criteria for, for choosing light sources, see which one works for your application. Uh, the, the ones that work best for LED, uh, once again, if you have long hours of operation uh, where maintenance for changing that uh, light or, uh, or light fixture is, is, uh, is, is, a, is a big issue. Uh, and then, you know, is number one, does the, the, the LED light fixture do what you want it to do? You don't want to compromise on light quality. Uh, of course, you want energy efficiency, and you're probably going to get that with LED. But it needs to be significantly better than other choices that are less expensive right now. Great. Well, these have been great questions um, for me. I feel very much more educated about LEDs. And I want to thank everyone for, I want to thank Mark, and I want to thank all of you for participating today. And we'll stay on the line for a little bit to, in case any of you have any additional questions. But otherwise, thank you, and we hope to see you, see you back at a future webinar.